So, Emily, on behalf of the ECB and its executive board, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today, and the floor is yours. Great. So, um, so I am gonna uh, gonna talk a little bit today about um, what we've been learning about COVID and schools, or what I've been learning over the last, um, really over the last year, but but more over the yeah over the last year, I guess it's been. Um, and uh, and then I'm you know very happy to take questions. I think that that we in the U.S. are sort of our schools are starting to reopen at this point. So we've, but we've been through a long period with very extensive um, school school closures. Um, so just to kind of set, set the stage, um, although I think this is probably fairly familiar to, to many of us, um, you know, when we, when things, uh, when the, the pandemic hit last year, basically all of the schools in the US and throughout almost all of Europe closed for in-person learning. Sweden was an exception. It's not the only exception, but, you know, largely everything shut down. And I think that at that time, there were very good reasons for that kind of extreme shutdown. Because if we think about in general, how we, uh, the, the way that respiratory viruses tend to work, schools do tend to be fairly significant sources of COVID, of spread of general respiratory viruses. So if you think about something like the flu um, or, you know, non-respiratory things like the like the chicken pox or the or the measles uh, before before vaccines, those things are really uh, highly spread in in schools. So when there is an unknown pandemic of a respiratory virus, it is very natural for an early uh, for an early response to be like let's shut down schools because we think that kids are likely to um, are likely to be vectors or be at risk and and so on. As the pandemic even sort of actually even as early as maybe March or April, really, as we learned more from, um, from, from China uh, and from some of the places that were hit early, it became pretty clear that at a minimum, children were not a high-risk group. Uh, and that's, that's been true for this whole time. And I think there's been debates about the, their role in spread and so on. But the idea that kids themselves are both at least somewhat less likely to become infected uh, with COVID and are particularly less likely to have serious consequences. That was true fairly early. That was true fairly early on. Um, and as that became clearer, uh, there was some move towards school reopening in Europe um, and, and in the UK. And so you guys know this, but uh, there was there were some schools. Um, the UK reopened some of their schools, in particular, in the kind of late spring and and summer. Uh, nothing in the US opened through the end of the school year. So, for, I mean, not, that's not like it's not like you literally could not find any open school. But basically, no significant amount of reopening occurred at all in the US throughout the entire sort of rest of that 2020 spring. But then in the US, as we got to kind of August and September, um, even kind of some schools here open in some states in, in late July, uh, there was some school reopening. It tended to be concentrated in what, you know, we would call here the, like the red states, um, you know, states that are sort of more traditionally uh, on the Republican side of the, of the political ledger. Um, so places like Georgia, Indiana, Florida, um, started to reopen. And, you know, in a lot of those places, they started to reopen kind of pr like what we think of as pretty regularly, um, you know, so they kind of opened for full time in person learning um, and they did did it kind of did it look kind of pretty, pretty normal. Um, but that but many places did not open. And so when we got into the fall, there was some more reopening and then there were some places that basically stayed closed. And then there was uh, over the sort of fall, there was kind of ebbing and flowing of opening and closing in, in the US and some of that in Europe, although I think you guys have been a bit more consistent with, with opening. In the US, in the winter, the sort of after like the um, January, sort of after kind of the winter surge, or maybe during it, actually, there was all of a sudden a much larger push for more reopening. The Biden administration has pushed very hard for schools to, to reopen. Um, and so over the course of the spring, we've seen much more, uh, kind of much more reopening. At this point, um, you know, virtual learning rates are, are much lower, although some states still have fairly high, fairly high rates. Um, and, you know, now we're starting to think already about the kind of 2021, 2022 school year and what's going to happen, um, what's going to happen, what's going to happen there. Um, so in this talk, I want to talk about sort of two things. First, I want to talk a little bit about kind of what we are learning about the consequences of school closures. 
Um, and uh, there's a lot more that will be learned about that over a very long period of time. But I just want to give a little bit of a flavor of what I think we are, um, what I think we are, we are getting so far. And then I want to talk um, a, a bit more because this is the part that I've been working on really about sort of can schools be safe. And to what extent are we learning about the, the safety of, uh, of schools and what makes them sort of safer in the US and, and almost just how does the data kind of evolve there? So let's start with the consequences of school closures. So, um, so the, the first thing I wanna talk about is what happened when we closed schools abruptly last spring. Um, so in, in the US, um, when we when we monitor schooling, most of the way we monitor is in kind of like point in time, large scale, like point in time, high stakes testing, which you actually didn't do much of last spring because of course it was supposed to happen in the spring and the schools were closed. And so some places tried to do it, but mostly they they didn't. Um, but so so we need to sort of look to other kinds of data to to see what was what was going on. This is kind of this sort of graph, which I'll explain to you, shows what I think is kind of my favorite uh, source of, of data on this. So this is a graph that uses data from an online learning platform called Zern. That's the name of the platform. And Zern is a, an online math, like math platform that a lot of schools use. It's linked up to the most common um, curriculum the Common Core curriculum, which is what a lot of schools in the U.S. use uh, use for their for their students, um, and so Zern is basically like a like a way that instead of you teaching the math, uh, Zern teaches your kids teaches the students in the class the the math through some like really nicely curated thoughtful videos. It's actually, a totally amazing resource if you're trying to homeschool your kids. Um, but what they what they have, what's sort of nice about these data is that they have very detailed tracking. They can see basically how much kids are online at every sort of moment. They can see when, when an individual kid logs on um, and they can see how much they are, they are doing and they measure uh, learning in something called badges. And so what this graph is showing is that basically we have a set of classrooms that are using this online program before the shutdown. So this is a part of their kind of normal classroom thing. So if you sort of look at this um, at this space here, the kind of January, February part of this, uh, we're kind of seeing like, you know, there's a little bit of cyclicality in, in how many badges kids are, are earning at any given week. And some of that is just, you know, when's a vacation week and, and so on. Um, but, but, you know, you're kind of seeing this tr truck along here. And then this is when schools close. And so what we see when schools close is that there is a huge drop off in these badges that students are, are earning. And that drop off is, is very much larger in school districts um, or in schools that are in districts with lower, uh, with lower income families. So if you sort of read this here, this says basically, when we stop, when kids stop going to in-person school, there's something like a 50 to 70 percent per, percent decrease in the the uh, basically amount of math that they are doing. Uh, so that kind of says, like more or less, they just kind of stop do, doing math. There is also some decrease uh, in these high-income districts, but it's much smaller. So this illustrates the what I think is the broad picture of what happened in the spring, which is that basically learning was in the, there was no, people stopped doing school much um, and schools were really poorly equipped. Even very fancy pants private schools, like my kid's school were just like very poorly equipped to move to some kind of online learning thing. It was just like, nobody had any idea what they were doing. Everybody was terrified, locked in their houses with their kids. It was not a good situation to be running an online school. Uh, and that was particularly deeply felt by, by lower income students. Um, and, you know, I will say, I think this is, if anything, kind of an understatement of how bad, uh, of how bad this was, because this is a, an online platform. This is a thing where literally they were already using the computer to do the math. So you would think of all the things we could port over into online learning, an online learning platform that we were already using seems like the best thing to port over. You know, forget about like I'm trying to teach some first grader to read by teaching them with some little some little books. That's going to be a lot harder to, to port over. And so if anything, I think this probably understates the kind of aggregate losses.
in the fall, students um, students come back, and now we have a little bit better, um, like a little bit better testing, um, a little bit more sort of sophisticated uh, testing. So one version is something called a MAP test. There's a lot of these tests. This is math scores. Um, and this shows kind of by grade on the sample that's in this math test, sort of like what's happening um, in fiscal year 19 and fiscal year, fiscal year 20. So uh, clearly we are still seeing here reasonably large declines um, in kind of how students are doing sort of percentile ranks on these tests. But just to be clear, the scale here is 40 to 60. So, you know, these declines are I'm sizable. I don't want to understate them, but they're not, you know, 70 percentage points. Um, and when we look at reading scores on something like this, actually not affected much. And I would say the kind of general picture of the learning losses in the fall is a, a dialed down version of the, of the picture in the spring. So it is still the case that the learning losses are bigger in lower income school districts um, and that there are some learning losses, but they are they are attenuated. And I think that's in part because we actually learned a little bit in part it's attenuated because some kids are at school, but in part it's attenuated because we learned something about how to do this kind of learning and it, that in fact, you know, you could do a slightly better job at it, even if it's not as good as being uh, at, at the school. The bigger issue, I, in some ways, um, which uh, bigger and poorly understood, are all of the other sort of follow-on consequences that I don't think we know very much about yet that we are going to learn more about as we go forward. So one, one very big one is just mental health of kids. There are a huge number of kids in the US who are not going to see an inside of the school classroom between March of 2020 and at, we hope, September of 2022, 2021. So that's, you know, kids who basically have been in their houses learning for, I don't know, six hours a day on Zoom. And it's not, you know, just 14 year olds, we're talking about seven year olds, we're talking about seven year olds who have spent the entire year, more than a year only learning on Zoom, not really seeing other people in person. The, the mental health consequences of that, I think we're starting to see some, we're seeing increases in emergency department uh, admissions for, um, for students, for, for suicide, for depression, anxiety, all of these things are kind of coming out, but we don't have a great infrastructure to, to measure those. And so I think that's something we're going to be getting more of over time. There are clearly also big impacts on female labor force participation. We saw this very sharply in the fall, where, uh, you know, in September, there was a huge drop in, in labor force participation, about a million people, of which about, um, 800, that, that was almost, it was like 800,000 women. So it's, it's, we're seeing drops in labor force participation and those drops being sort of very concentrated in, um, in, in women. Um, and actually one of my undergrads this semester wrote a paper looking at basically how those drops have linked up to, to schooling and showing that indeed in places in which schooling was less in person, those declines in female labor force participation were bigger. So not surprisingly, it looks like the sort of, if your kid is not at school, then you it is hard for you to be at a work, which I think would not surprise any of the parents on this call. Then sort of there's a, there's a kind of two other big pieces here, which is just there's a lot of parts of the school learning environment that we are, um, that are not directly measured with things like test scores. So kids dropping out, particularly in, you know, among high school students, kids who are delaying school entry, unclear how big a deal that is, exiting school early, totally abandoning public education. So in the US, one of the patterns um, is that private schools have largely been open uh, for in-person learning, even as um, as sort of what we, think, pub, what we call public schools, so like sort of the, the regular schools that most people are in have, have not been open. So we've seen places where people have basically just um, just kind of given up on, on public schooling and, and gone to a private school or an archdiocese Catholic school um, that, you know, those are, of course, disproportionately people with more resources. If those people start abandoning the public school system, that's really going to change the kind of power dynamics around a lot of these, um, a lot of these, these school districts. And of course, there's like a general exacerbation of, of inequality um, across students and, and schools. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit um, in the sort of second part of this about uh, the kind of school safety, because we, we sort of in a sense, like I think I'm trying to make a case that like the benefit of having in-person school is really big. In the US, we've been sort of fighting against 
the question of, okay, we all agree that the benefits are large, but if this is spreading COVID to everybody, then we need to, um, then we need to, to sort of try when maybe we can't have this and, and that like, there's a trade-off, right? Um, and so, so when we think sort of think about school safety, we kind of want to ask the question, like, does COVID spread in schools? And I said at the beginning, I think there are reasons we might think yes. Um, and that is because generally kids uh, spread respiratory illnesses. Early data basically suggested no. So we get kind of some evidence out of, uh, out of the, the European data um, suggesting that there was relatively little spread when schools were open. It's sort of generally fairly reassuring. Um, there, uh, there are sort of open, related open questions of what kinds of mitigation are important. So should we just open schools like totally regular? Should we do, should we be having kids undertaking uh, different kinds of prevention? And what would that, like, what would that look like? Um, and so I, my sort of way into this is I've been doing a lot of data collection uh, around this in the U.S. And I kind of got into this uh, actually not as a researcher. So my main job is, you know, being an economist or a parenting author or some other thing, um, but not being a person who collects data on, on schools. And I think in, in the U.S. we might have thought this would be the responsibility of, um, of the government, of the, we do have a federal government here. Um, we have a organization called the Center for Disease Control. We have an organization called the Education Department. Um, both groups might have been um, responsible for such, for such data collection. I mean, you know, unfortunate issue was that um, until, you know, recently the uh, federal administration over here wasn't um, really interested in science uh, and they, uh, they did not have any efforts to uh, try to do anything that would be helpful, it would be helpful. And so what happened is in August, schools started to open. They opened in Georgia, they opened in Indiana. And a lot of us looked out at this and we're like, oh, well, okay, well, it's not obvious that's a great idea. Like these, this was opening right in the middle of like this sort of summer surge in these places. And they were opening these schools and putting all the high school students in and nobody was wearing a mask and everyone was like, oh my God, this is gonna be awful. But it was like, all right, well, now they did it. Like, I hope that we're gonna be able to learn from this. And it became really clear that there was kind of no data effort to, to try to learn from this. Um, nobody was collecting any information. And when we came to this, we sort of came with kind of three pieces of, of question. Um, you know, one is just our schools like super spreaders, right? Are we going to see enormous outbreaks associated with uh, associated with these high school reopenings or this elementary school reopenings? Is this going to be the thing that like puts pushes everything? You know, is this the Biogen conference, which was like our big super spread of, event um, in in Boston? Um, the second question was, okay, well, if, if there is some super spreading, are there some places that don't do it and, you know, which mitigation factors are going to, are going to matter? Um, and then, you know, third kind of what, where is the spread? Who is spreading it? Is it student staff? Like what, what's, if we're seeing spread, what's, what's going on? Um, and so we wanted to design some data that would at least get us a little bit at some of these, some of these questions. Um, so, uh, so this is like a lot of the U.S. COVID response. It's a sort of cobbled together effort by just random people. Um, so I got together with uh, something called the School Superintendents Association. So just to be clear, in the US, um, there are school districts. They are very, very autonomous. Um, so you can sort of think about like there's a Chicago, there's a school district in Chicago, that's like one school district. But then there are like in Texas, there's 1200 individual school districts. And often these will be like, a district that has, you know, two elementary schools, a middle school, and a high school, and so they're and they are they were basically responsible for making all of their own choices in general, and also in the space of COVID. So decisions about reopening were were basically made by these individual districts, which left these districts in a really crummy position because now there's some school, some superintendent, some person who oversees this district. You know, their normal job is to is to kind of oversee two elementary schools, a middle school and a high school. Often they also have some other job. If it's small, then maybe they're the principal of one of the schools. Sometimes they're like also the bus driver. You know, these are like pretty like small places. And now you're telling them, OK, you need to be responsible for whether we open schools in the era of COVID. Like if you make it do it wrong, people will die. Good luck. Um, and I think that that was a really high stress situation. And so 
part of the motivation for this sort of their this association involvement here was that these school districts really want to be answers to some of these questions. We got some principal association. We got a data science team from Qualtrics. We have my team, which was just me. Now it's some other people. Um, and what we did was initially like super simple. We just went out to school districts and we said, hey, can you just tell us like how many people do you have in are your school in person, if any? How many staff do you have in person? Are you requiring people to mask? Are you requiring them to distance? Do you do anything about ventilation? And then we came back to them every two weeks and we said, how many COVID cases do you have? That's it. That was like our initial basic plan. It was sort of very, very simple. And initially we just did it with a kind of opt-in sample of schools and, and districts. And then we ultimately added to this a bunch of data from states that had sort of consistent data over time. And we sort of kept adding uh, over time. But, but unlike in a research project, our goal here was not to like wait till everything was perfect and then you know do it. Our goal was to be like, literally, we need to know some of this information right at this very moment. Um, and so we are just going to get this and we're going to post what we have and we're going to say what it is and we're just going to put it out so we can try to, you know, help speak to this conversation. So, uh, so just to give you a sense of kind of where we are in terms of numbers, um, we started this effort, um, basically the sort of first time we posted data was like early September, mid to late, maybe late September. And we had about, um, uh, I want to say like 700,000 um, in 700,000 enrolled students of whom about half of them were were in person during this period. Um, we added a few more, you know, in the first part of September, and then we started pulling in whole states. And so in the kind of for most of the school year, uh, our data set has been uh, about 12 million, um, 12 million enrolled students of whom, you know, basically about half of them are, uh, are, are in person um, to give you a sense. The sort of overall U.S. Um, K-12 population is about 56 million students. So, you know, we have some, we don't have all. Um, here is what, so, the, and then we, we get these like infection rates. And so here is what these look like. And so there are a lot of different ways to, to put these numbers to, together and talk about what they, what they mean. Um, but, but here is the simplest way is to just ask like what share of the students or staff uh, have COVID over a two week period. So they sort of given two week period. So if there's like, so this is like our sort of top number here is like, like 1.3. Um, and so what this says is in this, that's like the first two weeks of January. In the first two weeks in January um, of, a, of a thousand staff, we would expect on average to see um, like, what is it, thir 13? Um, yeah, 13. Um, I don't know, 13, <laughs> I'm off my orders of magnitude or it's a little early in the morning here. Um, we expect to see 13, 13 infections. Now, just to be like crystal clear, what we are collecting in these data is information on the number of students or staff who are affiliated with the school who have COVID, uh, not people who got COVID at school. We do not have any information about who got COVID at school. There's like, an, I'll flag a little bit of stuff at, at the end about this, but in general, what we were aiming to do was just to find out how many people around your school have COVID. And the reason we went with that approach, partly because it was the only option, but the other piece is if you, if I sort of think about how we were motivated early on and what we really wanted to know, you know a lot of our questions were just in the space of like, it, does everybody have COVID? You know, is the school overrun with, are we seeing these sort of big super spreader events? Like what are, what are we seeing? And I think that for that, this is kind of sufficient, right? So if you, if you sort of saw hundreds of people in a given school, that would be a real, you know, that would be a real signal. And that's something we, we'd show up, um, we'd show up here. Um, okay. So, so this is, and so this is kind of the pattern of here is really mimicking what happened in the U.S. over this period. We're seeing a uh, kind of increase this is sort of this winter surge, and then we're seeing uh, now things are much, uh, things are going much better. It is also true in general that we see staff infection rates much higher than student infection rates. That is reflecting, very likely reflecting simply age patterns in COVID infections. Um, so kids are less likely to be affected than, um, 
than than adults. The fact that we're now seeing these rates uh, kind of come come together is reflective of the fact that teachers in the U.S. were prioritized for for vaccinations. Um, so as of kind of February, a lot of teachers were already vaccinated, and certainly by the current period, um, you know, a big share of of teachers um, have already been sort of fully vaccinated. There are some states where we see pretty consistent data um, or we see very consistent data over this whole period, um, in particular New York, Texas, and Massachusetts. Um, so, you, so we can sort of graph um, graph this. And, and I actually should say, I mean, I can we can put it somewhere, somewhere in the chat. Um, all of the data for this is public. And so there's like a public dashboard. You can poke around in it and see what's see what's going on. Um, and so that was a big part of our goal was to try to actually make this sort of possible for people to, to play around with. Um, one interesting thing that comes particularly out of the New York data is an ability to look some at, um, at the, the kind of density of cases. Because you might have said, look, OK, maybe overall case rates are low, but maybe we're seeing um, you know, some concentrations of cases that look like there's a lot of spread in schools. That's actually really not what we saw in these data. So this um, says, you know, if we look at um, kind of, this is New York at some particular point, um, you know, 70% of the schools in this in this biweekly period have no cases. But then of the places that have cases, a, a large share of them are having kind of one or two, um, are having sort of small numbers of cases that really look like those are very likely to have been acquired elsewhere, to have been acquired kind of outside of uh, the school. And then there's just a person affiliated with the school who has, who has COVID. It's not that we don't see any clusters. So there is one, but it's it's like, like I can pick out a particular example. So like there's one uh, religious high school in New York that has, 50, has a cluster of 59 cases. Obviously something happened um, at that in that example, but there's very few of those. Um, it's not like that's something that's showing up every week. That's something we see a couple of over the course of like the entire school year. So finally, a, so a couple other things I wanted to, and I apologize that these are a little, um, a little small, um, but in the US there's been a lot of focus, and I'm happy to talk more about this because I think this has been sort of very different from the European case, but there's been a lot of focus on masking and distancing in schools. Um, and in particular, on the on the role of those things in lowering um, lowering trans transmission rates. Um, and so here we kind of divide the sample. I think most interesting is to look at at high community transmission, which is this like the time periods, in states, locations where there's a lot of transmission. And and what we are seeing is that um, in places where uh, masks are required, we are seeing particularly for staff. Somewhat lower, um, somewhat lower rates. So, sort of things that are kind of looking like, uh, like the masks are protecting the staff from from infection. A second very common mitigation in the U.S. was requiring distancing. Um, this is a little tricky to think about because, in fact, if you have ever been to, like, my kid's school says that they do six feet of distancing, and you know, I frequently receive emails full of pictures where the kids are like wrestling with each other. So obviously the, there's a difference between saying that your kids could be in principle be six feet of distance, but in fact, uh, definitely are, are not. Um, but when we look across those, perhaps for that reason, when we look across these groups um, for no distancing, three feet, six feet, we're actually generally not seeing that that's mattering very much for, for a case rate. So I think the kind of distancing piece of this is looks like it's less less important than the than the masking in this in this period. Um, so uh, so final final slide is just to, to well not final I have one more thing two more things to say but final data slide is just to uh, to look at one of the things we, we're trying to figure out sort of like how, does it look like schools are are higher risk than than other places and the answer is basically no that that kind of community rates uh, and school rates are really tracking each other very um, are really tracking each other very closely. Um, so there are a lot of limitations uh, to our uh, to our data, but I think actually rather than telling you about those, of which there are many, um, let me sort of highlight uh, two um, two some other data and that sort of and say something about about what we're sort of learning from from kind of more almost more academic data, I guess I'd say that's come out over the last um, over the last few months because 
one of the things I think our data added was that we were out very early. So in a place when sort of people who were like trying to do careful contact tracing data collection, they those papers kind of started to come out in December. Um, I think we were we were sort of early on in saying, look, you know, our school super spreaders know and saying that in early October uh, when, you know, there was maybe more time for some for some opening. But when better data came came out, it does seem to support this sort of general picture. So uh, so one is uh, there's like a large data set from North Carolina where they followed about 90,000 uh, students and staff in person school for nine weeks. Uh, there were 773 people affiliated with the school who were kind of like had COVID, who had quite somehow got COVID. Um, but it, when they sort of dialed down to like, okay, of those 773, to what extent were there school infections? They saw only 32 of them. Um, and so that's a, I don't know, like a secondary attack rate of like 0.04%. It's like very, very small number. Um, and importantly there, and this is a very consistent pattern, they did not see any transmission from students to staff. So when we are seeing infections in school, it is largely between staff members. Uh, when it was not between staff members, it was either staff members to students or it was students among each other. Um, and again, that last group is actually the, the smallest, um, but we did see some, we do see some, you know, kiddos uh affecting affecting each other uh there's also some data from from wisconsin um which is showing um was also sort of showing very limited transmission um we are in the u.s we're very into sports youth sports um and there has been an increasing amount of evidence suggesting that youth sports uh are a source of some infections so there's some cdc stuff about wrestling um and you know, I think what we learned from that is that like an indoor wrestling, unmasked wrestling tournament is a good way um, to spread COVID. And I think if you sort of think about the mechanisms of COVID and you think about how wrestling works, it wouldn't be very surprising that a sport where you literally put your face next to another person's face um, might be a good way to spread a respiratory, uh, a respiratory virus. Um, so we're probably not having any wrestling tournaments. Um, so what do I think are the kind of big takeaway takeaway lessons here? So I think one is that schools can be operated safely. And then in fact, this is not a high risk environment. Uh, one of the most frustrating aspects of this whole discussion in the US is that there have been many places where we have seen, you know, bars and restaurants and gyms and, you know, indoor water parks open and not schools. Uh, and it has, I think you guys have had less of an issue with that. But I think for, for many parents in the US, it sort of felt like, Oh, like, are you kidding me? Like, this is not only is this very important, but it's also pretty safe. And so relative to some of these other things, it feels like our risk benefit calculus has been really has been really off. Um, I think there is some evidence that that masking may may matter, um, particularly for for staff that may the importance of that may change as more of the staff are vaccinated. Uh, youth sports are kind of a problem. Um, community rates matter for, for school rates. Uh, as we at least move into the fall, I think that there's a lot of questions about kind of how can we make this school normal? I think there's a lot of fear, um, there's a lot of fear. Uh, and, uh, and we're gonna have to kind of dial that, um, dial, dial that back. Um, but uh, I think we, we, can, we, we can get there, or I hope we can get there, particularly as, um, as adults are vaccinated, community rates have, have started to go, to go down. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm excited to hear questions. Great. Um, thanks so much, Emily. Um, so I have uh, one question on the consequences uh, that you talked about in terms of the widening gap between private and public schools in the U.S., mm -hmm. which, of course, is a longstanding issue, as you said, for inequality and all that. Um, and you, you, you talked about how this gap has increased further from a learning perspective. And then later you spoke about infection rates. And the question is whether there are also sizable differences in infection rates between these two different types of schools. So is there something you learn about either the behavior of children or teachers in those two different types of schools? And do you see it in the numbers? Yeah. So, so it, it's a little bit of a tricky question to, to sort of think about. I think that if you want to think about how to organize this data, uh, 
the way that we or the way like the easiest way to organize this data is to imagine that there is very little in school transmission and that differences across schools in how much COVID there is are mostly driven by the infection rates in the community and in the sort of groups of people who come to the school. And so it is, is it true that we've seen, I mean, I was trying to think like in general, it's, I mean, it probably rates are a bit lower in private schools, but, um, but not in any, you know, very consistent, um, not in any very consistent way. Uh, and I think it really, it, it is because, you know, the kinds of precautions, everybody's kind of taken pretty similar, um, pretty similar precautions. Um, and they're being, and their infections are largely being driven by what's happening in their community, uh, in their, in their communities outside. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, another question is about the, the infection rates that you showed in schools with this interesting difference between teachers and, and, uh, and uh, the pupils. So I guess there's sort of two sets of questions. One is sort of this data jumps out to, to kind of draw a lesson to say, you know, protect the teachers, stupid kind of, you know, and uh, uh, it happened in the US, but very late in the game, it seems. So is this something that may, I mean, what's your view on that? Should that have happened earlier? But you mean the other, the teacher yeah, made teacher vaccinations? Yeah, or some other way of protecting yeah. teachers. Okay. Yeah. Um, but indeed, when uh, the, the other question is in terms of vaccination, so it's very interesting to what you showed that after vaccination of teachers, the two curves kind of converge. So the teachers and the students for infection rates. Um, so could we take away from this is the question that if we, since for children it's low anyway that if we vaccinate children that may not it may not make such a big difference i mean basically the the biggest you know the biggest thing to do was to vaccinate the teachers is that one lesson yeah. you would take yes okay so let me answer both both of those so i think that on the first thing um you know, i think we understood the the importance of of protecting the staff and that that was an important group to, to work with. And I think they were in many places, the staff were prioritized for vaccinations over, you know, it's like that, that was a priority group in a lot of places in the, um, in the US. There clearly is more we could have done in the fall. And so I think many of us felt that we didn't do enough testing, that that was kind of a big fall down was that we, uh, we should have been doing more like surveillance testing in the fall focused on, this, on the staff. Um, and, you know, that was, Partly it was kind of expensive and partly, you know, there was some resistance and so on. So the, there clearly were things that we could have done better if we had under, if, if we had approached this differently. I think the issue was not so much that we didn't understand that it was a problem, but that it was, um, you know, that, that it was, we just like fell apart in a lot of different, um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, the, the other kind of interesting piece of this is that, uh, you know, a lot of the places, um, a lot of the places that did open there, like there sort of was a, a more general kind of, I don't know, COVID denial is just pejorative, but like many of the places that had the most aggressive openings were also places where people weren't necessarily taking COVID, like other COVID things super seriously. And so it was, it was like, there was a rare place, like I, the place I live, so I live in Rhode Island, which is a very small state next to Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, and, and we are kind of among the very few sort of democratic states which did open a lot of most of the public schools. And so there, there, you know, I think there was a lot of effort to kind of try to do the things that we would need to do to protect teachers and, and so on. I think there were other places where it was more like, yeah, everybody goes to work, like you go to work, this is your job, go to work, like wear a mask, it's fine. Um, but we could have done, we could have done more. There are a lot of discussions at the moment in the US around now that teachers are vaccinated, like, okay, like, like what, What's the big, you know, what's the big deal? Like, let's just like have it kind of regular. Um, and I, I think that uh, that there's a lot of there's a lot of disagreement there. I think part of what's happened is, you know, people have gotten 
people are still worried about kids. There's a lot of, you know, a really heated debate here around, you know, kids and vaccines and okay, those aren't going to be ready for like a while. I think there are people who are like, well, who cares? Kids are a low risk group anyway. Like, let's just like act regular now that we have adults vaccinated. Isn't that what we were waiting for? I think there are other people who say, well, you know, if even one kid in America gets COVID and, and dies, which of course could, could happen, um, that it won't have been worth it. And I think that, you know, we're struggling a little bit here, probably you are also with how to trade off these, um, how to appropriately deal with these risks, given the amount of real fear that is sort of in, that has become the COVID has been wrapped up in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Now very clear. Um, so uh, there are also two questions around um, the staff testing intensity numbers that you showed. So one is a more technical question of whether this testing intensity is constant or whether it could otherwise be adjusted for if it's not constant. Um, and the other related question is whether the data that you presented also covers the period with more aggressive mutations. The variants. Yeah, yeah. The so, variants, which... right. So we don't, so the testing thing is actually very, um, so we, we don't really, um, no, the they sort of short answer is we don't actually know how much testing there is. We know that this matters in the sense of like, if you look at the New York data, um, we know that in the, in the like winter, New York is doing a ton of testing of teachers and their estimates suggest like teachers were 10 times as likely to be tested as the kind of general population. So of course that's gonna kind of drive case rates up some because they're testing, they're testing more. It would be better if everybody were tested if for COVID all the time, if we all sort of, all this like science people agree agree with that that hasn't happened we're sort of limited to to reporting out what we um what we have i think that you know this is why we try to give these comparison rates we try to sort of talk about comparisons to community rates where at least if the testing of this group is consistent with the testing in the rest of the community then those rates are then those rates are comparable of course if they're if they're not you know i mean Again, I kind of, I kind of often fall back in this on saying, look, there, you know, there are a lot of really detailed things that we would, that we would like, and for which these data are not that well suited. If your question is, are we seeing huge outbreaks in school? I think our data are really well suited for that. And I think ultimately there are some other things about the data that will be helpful in kind of long term, long term things. But these kind of like, like people will be like, what about lunch? Like my data is not well suited to tell you like how students should have lunch. You know, we don't we don't have enough um, enough information there um, on the variants. Variants. Um, you know, we are still collecting data now, so we're seeing the you know we're seeing the data now when there are some places where there are more. Um, you know, there's there's kind of more variants. You know, people have sort of talked in people have talked about the idea that the variants are relatively more infectious for kids. My sense of the latest UK data was that that's actually, at least at least for B117, that's actually not really true. It's just that they're generally more infectious. And so, of course, they're relatively more infectious for everybody. There's been a lot of rhetoric here around, OK, well, you know, in this latest wave, particularly in Michigan, we're seeing more younger people, you know, relatively more younger people, relatively more kids. It's really unclear whether that has anything to do with the variants or whether it's just that old people are vaccinated. And so the kind of people who are less susceptible are younger people. And because the old people are vaccinated, we kind of opened all kinds of stuff. And then people started going out and doing stuff, not, not particularly going to school, but you know, going out and going to bars and restaurants and doing this, that, and the other thing. And then some people got, got COVID. So I think it's gonna, it's hard. The data is making it hard to separate out the role of variants from, from everything else, at least in the in the US. Thank you. Um, next question is, do we have evidence that the consequences of closing schools can be overcome in the future? Most people seem to think that they will. I, so I think there's there are a, a, some things for sure which we cannot overcome, some things which I think we are likely to be able to overcome and some things where we don't. So I think on the first piece, sort of things we can't overcome, there are choices that were made in this year that will not be easily undone. So there are students, high school students who dropped out who aren't gonna finish high school and they're not gonna come back and finish it next year. Like we're not getting those people. Uh, we're not getting those people back. Those are real long-term consequences that we will see. 
I'd also put in that group, you know, the category of kind of people who left their jobs, like parents who left their jobs, who may of course return, but we know that when you take a gap in, in the, in your resume, you're less likely to return, you return in a different, in a different way. Like we're going to see some, some real losses there. I think those will not be made up. The, then there's the more basic question of like, look, some kids didn't really learn the second grade, like, you know, are they going to be able to catch up and like learn the third grade? And they are kind of more optimistic because I think that we, if we have that at least a, with appropriately used resources, we could catch up a lot of that. You know, we know that one-on-one -on -one tutoring can be helpful for, um, can be helpful for kids. If you think about a lot of these early stage things, like kids need to learn to read, they need to learn to like add and subtract. We kind of know how to catch people up on those when they're, when they're behind. And if we get enough resources in place, I think we'll be able to do that. The place where I'm, I think we're least sure is this piece of kind of like mental health, sort of long-term, like socio-emotional, like trauma, basically trauma scarring um, of, you know, this was not, um, you know, e even for people with a lot of resources and kids whose families have a lot of resources and have a lot of computers and have a parent home and whatever, this has been really, really challenging. Um, you know, I think it's just not, it's not the way that people want to be. And I think people are seeing a lot of those kinds of, um, a lot of those kinds of consequences. Um, I, we're just, we're gonna have to see how they play out over time. Yeah, uh, actually the, the previous speak in our uh, series spoke about mental health and it was a pretty alarming situation it's indeed. It's bad for the children and the parents and basically everyone so <laughs> yeah, i think it's bad for people's relationship with their kid i mean you know this is not yeah. the relationship that many people wanted to have with their um you know with their kids yeah. now and it was very striking how uh, also the what you said about it's not necessarily the math skills but it's the social uh, yeah. interaction skills that was yeah. uh, could you say a little bit more about that yeah i mean i think um I think it's sort of interesting because I see this partly because the sort of the people I know, the people I talk to the most, you sort of, I see this from kind of the, the standpoint of, I mean, the people who are in some ways are the most privileged, which is like people who, you know, who have a lot of resources, who maybe have the time to take some time, whatever, with their kids. And I think one of the things that, that happened for many of those people, and I sort of candidly for, for me, is that we had this, um, this sort of idea that like, if your kids are are like if we're like homeschooling our kids like they'll learn so much math you know and like we can like really like use this opportunity to like i don't know like not this an opportunity but like people sort of thought like okay my kids not my good school doesn't push them enough in math and i'm gonna push them more and i, I think one of the things people learned is like actually that like sometimes you can do that right like actually there are some good online platforms for learning math and it is possible for your kid to keep up in those in those things or maybe even just sort of move beyond but that that what was really really missing is the part where you like interact with other kids and where you go to school and that piece of school is so much more important than i think many of us recognized and when we think about school as kind of okay you go to school to learn to read yeah that's something people learn at school um but you know you you could teach your kid maybe you know how to read you could probably teach your kid to read um, but the, the thing you cannot deliver is the environment of like learning to interact with other kids and learning to how to problem solve. And I, and I think as people's kids have gone back to school, they have realized that, that, that they're kind of like, they missed that, right? They sort of missed a, a period of that. Um, and that that is a huge part of what we are doing with, with education is teaching people to interact in a society and to work out problems that they have with other people, because ultimately as adults, like that's actually a really important part of being a person. Uh, and when people have asked, so one of the questions people sometimes ask is, what do you think will be, um, what do you, th what do you think are some long-term changes that we'll see, you know, around sort of society around, uh, after this and, or around schools rather, I think we will see, I think the two big things we're likely to see are one, um, a move to more individualized online instruction for some things. So actually one really good learning here for the for the us is that there actually are some really good ways that you can uh help differentiate kids and help kids sort of 
who are behind catch up and who are ahead, you know, move beyond using these kind of online online learning platforms. I think we will see much more of that. But I think in exchange, we will see a lot more focused time spent in school on some of these um, socio-emotional curricula or where they actually try to teach you how to problem solve in social situations. They try to sort of teach you the kind of like how to how to be a person um, in the same way you would try to teach like how to add. Um, and I, I think we'll see a little bit of that shift. So, um... So then there's one question, which is very US specific, I guess. Um, which is the stark difference that you uh, showed in terms of between, again, the public schools and the private schools, that it also mixed with the socioeconomic kind of background. So what, from a European perspective, seems a little bit strange is that there wasn't sort of a much stronger pushback to, to keep schools open because at least the way we look at the U.S. is that the social safety net is is weaker. Uh, daycare facilities are not available for everyone. Um, you have very few vacation days. So if you are a working parent and the school is no longer there, how do you manage? Um, this was difficult here, um, as many colleagues can <laughs> can uh, echo, but. To us, it's like, I mean, I guess sort of, it's sort of like what's behind the numbers, the data that you show that must have been awful. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, there are, uh, there are a sort of two things that are, that are probably very different. I don't know exactly how important they, they are, but I think that sort of, they're, they're kind of two I would highlight. So first of all, I will say a lot of people are extremely angry about this. So it's not like everyone was like, oh, this is a great system. Like everything's going great. Like people were very mad. Um, but the, I think the two things that have made it difficult to um, make progress on this are one, I think actually a, a lot of families um, are were scared. So, and I think that our our approach to our kids, um, I was talking to a sort of European colleague about this, and he said this, and I I think it's kind of right, although I don't have empirical evidence. I think that that in the U.S. we have a much um, more like safety oriented like we're like much more cautious about children. You know, it's like, there's a, there's a rule like, you know, kids under, there are rules like, you know, you can't let a kid play outside by themselves in like if they're under 12, right? So we have a sort of set of things, which I think are a bit different than some of the norms in Europe around kind of child, child independence. And I think reflect not, not things about how much you like your kid, but just like, like aspects of physical safety that the US sort of takes a different approach to than some other places. So I think some of what happened is just, there wasn't as much push to reopen as you might have thought because people were afraid that their kids would uh, would die, even though that was like uh, like not realistic um, or you know not very, really, 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 really tremendously unlikely. Um, there was just like a lot of, a lot of fear. And that's one piece. But I think a, a much bigger piece is that in a lot of places, the teachers unions opposed reopening um, and the kind of, uh, that, that's just like, that's like a factor in the U S and if you look at kind of where schools open and where they didn't open, a lot of that has to do with, you know, where the teachers unions were, um, were, were powerful that interacts with the second, with the first piece rather, because I think some of what happened is teachers, even when schools were going to start to open teachers actually, in some cases would say to their students, you know, or to parents, like, don't send your kid back because the district is trying to kill us. That the district is trying to kill the teachers. And I think that's continued to be, and it's not all like, it's not all like any, by any means all teachers. And I think this has been a big issue within these unions that people do want to go back and some people don't, but that's uh, the union piece of this is clearly a, a, it's clearly a factor. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's of course, that's very different here indeed. So a related question is how do low income families deal with the issue of lack of hardware? <laughs> Uh, to do homeschooling in the U.S. And, and this was an issue here in Europe. Almost all the districts. So this is like the one thing that people did in the fall is basically a huge amount of, of money was spent by districts to give every kid a, a laptop. So we basically went to like sort of most of these four urban districts went to kind of one to one. Um, every student gets a laptop or an iPad um, and they just delivered them to them. And then actually in a lot of places, cities, and municipalities set up Wi-Fi, um, set up Wi-Fi. Like, so now everybody had Wi-Fi. Um, 
So that was like one thing we did that was okay. Good. <laughs> um, so the, a different question here is actually something you haven't uh, talked about, and, and I don't know if you have done research on yourself or maybe you have seen research from, by others, but basically universities. I mean, you're mm -hmm. yourself, of course, at the university, and we, we think of university students as adults. Um, <laughs> do we? So, do we think of them as adults? Know. Okay. <laughs> That's sure, some people might. Okay. <laughs> so, um, how much of what you have to say sort of basically applies, you think, also to the university? Almost none. So, I think one of the things that has been so striking about these discussions is that, like, while we are simultaneously saying, like, you know, we're not seeing a lot of outbreaks in schools, we are seeing, like, in the fall, there was like huge outbreaks in universe, and it's continued to be true, right? So, I just often I will say, like, it is. Uh, in some ways, really astonishing that we didn't see bigger outbreaks in high schools, because if you like look at a map of Pennsylvania, you can see where cop like where Penn State is. Penn State is a is like a state is Penn State College. Like you can see that on the map of the COVID map because it's like a bright red chunk, right? They just like have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases. And of course, most of these are, the students are fine, like this is a low risk group, but we saw just huge outbreaks in, in universities and the places that managed to kind of keep those under control. So like my, you know, my university did pretty, we did pretty well, but we still had some, you know, reasonably sized outbreaks, particularly in the, uh, in, in the winter. And that was in the context where we tested every single person who was on campus twice a week since August. And so every day, every two twice a week, I go and get tested with like a PCR test and we process and we're doing that for everybody. And still we had some outbreaks. And so, you know, in some sense, like the university environment in terms of, I don't know, I don't think we have a great understanding of why, but some aspect of this has meant like, these are just very high risk um, people, environment, something, and, and they're not like schools. So. Not so zero correlation. <laughs> okay, Basically good. zero correlation. Yeah. I mean, I think in you know here in the U.S., when people come back to to university in the fall, they're I think every place is going to require vaccines mm -hmm. for students. Well, Emily, um, so I've run down all the questions, and anyway, we are at the end of, of the talk. Good so very good timing indeed, and uh, so thank you so much for doing this. Um, I I hope we can share your slides and anyway yeah, the videos available. So um, wish you all the best. Stay Thank healthy. you. Good luck with the good luck with your schools. Yes, same to you. Okay. Right. Bye now. Bye, everybody.